gardens, they literally can be um, proactive regenerators. So, you know, just from even the idea that a tree there is bringing down carbon from the air, but how, so how you look after it and how you enact in your garden is going to make tangible positive differences. It will never be purely wild because it's, it's an interaction between ourselves and nature. Um, but it will, it can be, um, uh, you know, much more uh, regenerative uh, than anything else. Welcome to the Food Garden Life Show. We think that growing and cooking together builds families and builds communities. Our goal is to inspire and inform with stories and ideas about gardening, food, and people, and we give gardeners permission and confidence to challenge the rules. Brought to you by Emma and Stephen Biggs. Thanks for hanging out with us today. everyone, I'm Emma Biggs and thank you for hanging out with us today on the Food Garden Life Show. I'm a Gen Z gardener, author, speaker, and blogger and my passion is growing tomatoes, trying new and unusual crops, and saving seeds. I'm also the author of the kids gardening book Gardening with Emma and my co-host here on the show is my dad, Stephen. Hey everyone, I'm Stephen Biggs, food gardening guy, horticulturist, author, and horticultural journalist. I'd like to think that I'm an ecologically thoughtful gardener. I'll buy bamboo stakes over the horrid plastic-coated metal ones. But doesn't that bamboo come from around the world? I grow an untamed strip of meadow in my yard, but my veggie garden, it's all about controlling nature. Isn't a veggie garden about dominance? And any plants that I buy, they all come in plastic pots. The world of gardening is filled with plastic. The idea of gardening being natural can seem like a contradiction, so how can we as individuals make a difference? And where's the sweet spot where growing food meets the natural world? Our guest today walks us through these questions. Matt Rees Warren is a professional gardener and garden designer who's passionate about using individual gardens to strengthen biodiversity and lessen environmental degradation. Matt believes that we, as individual gardeners, can each help to make a change. And he says, don't wait for governments to act. Get started in your own garden. His new book is The Ecological Gardener, How to Create Beauty and Biodiversity from the Soil Up. So stay tuned for a fascinating chat with Matt about some of the philosophy that guides his ecological approach to gardening, but also some very hands-on ideas that you can try in your own food garden. Have you thought about coppicing? Or alcoholic hedges? Or do you know what bleachers are? Well, stay tuned. And you can find Matt online at mattreesewarren.com, so M-A-T-T-R-E-E-S, W-A-R-R-E-N dot com. As always, a thanks to our listeners who connect with us through social media and email. A shout out today to Sean, who wrote in about a post I shared on garlic, and to Patrick, who, when he heard last week's episode with Alan Burgo talking about cooking squash tips, wrote in to say, out here in Southwest USA, people cook squash flowers like chili relenos dipped in beaten egg white or light batter, then golden fried. Thanks for sharing that, Patrick. Also, a shout out today to our listeners on Reality Radio 101. Do you have show ideas, questions, or feedback? We want to hear what you think. So tell us. If you drop by foodgardenlife.com, you can email us, or you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where we hang out under the handle Food Garden Life. And you can also find me on Instagram as Emma Biggs underscore grows. And you can also find me on my website, emmabiggs.ca. Now, here is our chat with Matt Rees Warren, author of The Ecological Gardener, How to Create Beauty and Biodiversity from the Soil Up. And Matt is joining us from the UK. Matt, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. 
Ah, thank you for inviting me on. Look forward to it. We're delighted to have you here. Why don't we start out, Matt, finding out about the inspiration for your new book, The Ecological Gardener? Yeah, um, the idea the, for the book was really born, um, you know, 2019. There was a really large push um, of understanding and knowledge and reports and scientific information uh, upon um, not only climate change, but also um, sort of biodiversity declines. So the sort of major reports like the um, IPCC and the IPBES um, both released reports around 2019 that I thought lifted the consciousness and the conversation around these issues. And there was this feeling in the air that it was it stepped up. There was always an idea that um, climate change and ecological biodiversity declines were there and we knew that, but it, it sort of seemed to have gone up a level. And so it made me stop and think and, and go, what, what does this mean in my own world, my own little world of um, gardening? So I'm a professional gardener, I work with clients, I, I work in public gardens. So it made me think, you know, I can't quite handle the big countries sort of battling this thing out. They move like heavy tankers very slowly, but we as people and in my own little world, what can I do and what can we do as as gardeners, because we can kind of move as individuals, you know, to make changes and make differences. So um, I was just pitching out um, articles as I usually did. And I, I suddenly just thought, well, a garden in a, a context of uh, ecological awareness, maybe that's more than an article. And it just grew from there. I felt like it was taking the um, sort of uh, the pulse of the time and, and putting it to my, my world. Now, I think a lot of people and home gardeners are aware of organic gardening, but uh, you talk about in the book that there's a bit of a difference between organic gardening and ecological gardening. So before we go any farther, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think organic um, is one facet, I guess, because it kind of comes from the, um, you know, the food and agriculture and against pesticide use. And so within a garden and with an ecological mindset towards gardening, organic would certainly be a, a, a strong tenement towards that. But I think ecological gardening to me and, and to the sort of ethos that I was trying to put into the book is um, a whole a holistic whole. So it's a mindset. It's saying that everything that you are um, you know, doing in the garden, the craft that you are enacting is thought about in a nature first, um, you know, a bandwidth. So whether that involves uh, organic or whether that involves um, wildlife gardening or no dig or whatever, you know, uh, or using native plants, if you are focusing your mind towards the fact that you see your garden as a, a place in a, which you can restore balance towards nature and your every action is nature first, then that, that would be the difference, I think, between ecological thought and gardening and organic, because organic can be just against the pesticide, but it can be very strongly um, against uh, the pest, if you know what I mean, the way in which it is done is, is still um, going to be, I want to grow my um, carrots and marrows and peas perfectly, but I'm just not going to use those things, but I'm still going to just try different organic methods. And I guess an ecological gardening mindset wouldn't really think like that. It, it would think that you're in balance there with nature. And if you lose crop, you lose crop like, because, you know, you're not trying to feed the world. You're only maybe trying to feed yourself. But um, I think that would be the distinction that would run true between the two. And and as you're saying that, I'm thinking of how as gardeners, sometimes we can be control freaks and a garden sometimes is all about control. But really in, in your ecological um, gardening approach, we're talking about maybe having less control, right? Absolutely, yeah. I do think that is one of the gardening sort of methods that has been brought over through generation you know because you can go way back you can go back to the formal gardens um, of uh, Italy and, and Holland and France that have influenced not only England but America or Australia or um, South Africa wherever there is a gardening culture 
and that is about sort of human dominance of nature it's about um showing off your control so topiary uh, closely cut lawns um you know uh, hedges is almost walls yeah it, it, that that was where it came from and that sort of control idea has, has brought itself forward and we kind of look at gardens as outdoor rooms um, and so we sort of almost have come to believe that that's the way to keep them you know very neat very tidy and um, very ordered and when you begin to sort of say okay so the quarry here is gardens are like agriculture then that would be the immaculately um you know plowed field with mono species cultures everywhere and nothing and um, you know that that is the antithesis of uh, natural ecological balance. So it is the same in the garden. You kind of have to step back and go, you know, I can't um, not see the benefit from leaving a hedge to go uh, long for a year to allow berries uh, to form that will feed the birds, to allow uh, nesting, you know, during the nesting season to never cut it in that time is to start to think ecologically instead of thinking okay got to cut the hedge now because that's when it's traditionally done over here we have this uh, sort of uh, labor days the day you cut your hedges you know or trim your topiary um, and that's the middle of summer and that's the middle of sort of nesting time for birds so you start to think okay how do i reimagine this and how do i re-engineer my mind to think a little bit differently here and you know, I'm, I'm certainly not, you know, saying that I've lived this life forever. It's, it's more that I am constantly asking myself these questions when I'm gardening as a professional gardener in clients' gardens and, and, and in my own garden, just saying, should I do that? I mean, how, what effect does that have? And do I need to do that? And, and you realise if you step back a bit, you give control away. Uh, the benefit and the gain is huge um, for biodiversity and abundance. Okay, and I want to take a step back for a second to you're talking about pests and how sometimes maybe from an ecological gardening standpoint, it's best just to let them do their thing. But for home gardeners who want to harvest a lot, where is that balance between maybe putting up row cover and letting maybe slugs eat some of your crops? Where How do people find that balance between the two? It is a good question because, um, you know, as I said that, I, I needed to give the... Um, uh, you know, extra element that the fact that the ecological gardener, the book, I did actually write only towards the ornamental gardening um, gardener, because that there is a limit there, there is a difference. And I feel like there's two books, really, because every garden doesn't need to be either a veg or, or um, ornamental, but the difference is quite large. They, they are, you do have different trains of thought. So I, I totally understand where you're coming from. And and I certainly, you know, it is where you come up against pests the most, you know, when you're growing your, your broccoli, your cabbages, and, and you need to keep the caterpillars off. Um, so I, I think, you know, I definitely adhere hugely to the, um, you know, polyculture idea. So if you can, you know, that French intensive method, as it were, so if you can block in as much uh, as different species of um, fruit, vegetables all together, and then you give up a certain percentage of that land or space should I say or bed over to um, what would be not just ornamental but sort of a, a processed plant so I kind of seed in uh, wildflower annuals around the edges of all um, the beds that I use so maybe other you know people use marigolds or whatever or calendulas then you know that's going to give you that um, polyculture even more so it's, it's sort of getting towards the companion planting but that is quite I think that's a lot more complex than people realize so knowing the specialist relationships for each pest towards each plant is quite complex and entomologists study that for most of their life but it's getting towards that if, if you have a diversity of species then you're going to have a much um, better chance to be able to control those pests without um, having to go in and use whether it is sort of biological controls or or different sort of um, even organic methods of doing that. Um, that that would be the way and that is the way that I approach it and and netting you know I think that is that is one of the hardest things for me to let go because I try to 
and I have tried for the last few years to force all plastic out of the garden and the netting is the one that is the hardest because it is quite difficult to protect um, leafy greens yeah. especially if they're young um, as you as you guys will know so uh, I don't think like it's against all kind of ecological thought to net species but if you think that you're just going to lose the whole lot because no one would want to garden that way and lose all of the effort they put in but I think it's just about giving a balance nothing's dogmatic about this it's just saying you know hey we, we we've got a situation here we can we could be great sort of um you know portals of regeneration in our garden so just have a, a thought over there for that you know grow your veg grow your fruit and veg put in your effort enjoy that because that's the joy of gardening but always try and think you know hang on you know i shouldn't be getting too too down on that caterpillar because that turns into the beautiful butterfly that i, I want to take pictures of and and helps pollinate our plants so and so it sounds like we're not talking in in absolutes but we're keeping in mind and looking for this ecological significance in the garden and then trying to find a balance absolutely yeah i, I don't think um dogmatic rules and sort of um, overbearance really works with people you're going to want to go out and do what you want to do to find your passion and, and your joy of gardening and I, I gardening is for absolutely everyone i truly believe that and just the more people that garden the better so i'd never want to stop someone at the gates and say no 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 you know can't do it that way that's <laughs> that's really not what it's about but i think it's it's definitely about saying look there's traditional methods here that have just carried on that you don't need to follow um you really don't need to just cut your lawn down to a bowling green because that's what you've known since you were a, a boy or a girl or a young you know in your childhood in your mother's and father's childhood uh, you know you don't have to um, there is a different way and um, being brave and being sort of open and adaptable to be slightly different in your methods is, is just i think a great boon about your own garden i know you work for other people in gardens but what does your own garden look like because that probably will give us a picture into your thought process as you're gardening yes yeah, it's, it's a funny one i mean uh, it's almost like talking to a chef who um, works in a, in a really top class restaurant and then goes home to this <laughs> tiny little kitchen in uh, you know <laughs> the back sort of so my garden is tiny it's tiny it's like this north facing tiny little garden um it's like five meters by five meters so I, I love the challenge you know and i've got two young daughters so um that's why it's always you know i knew that what i was saying i can adapt and use to any situation um because it is it's about what you do with your hands, with your mind, and what you can change with small spaces to large. You can, you can really, you can, you can sort of adapt to everything. And, you know, lots of people are always saying to me, oh yeah, but I have, you know, kids and they want to do this. And, and I'm saying, yeah, so do I, <laughs> that's okay. You could, you could definitely have a bit of lawn. I'm, I'm never saying don't because they want to sit on it. And it's just that balance of finding different ways of bringing in wildlife and, um, you know, using, pots and, and vertical elements and and trying things out um, you know in in tiny little corners that you didn't think you know had anything going for it and it was too dark you can always try things you know you can put in um different stuff like you know i've got um my verma compost out there i've got little compost piles you know even in the smallest space you can make your own compost you can begin to sort of start your systems and close loops you know you can you can do it um, it isn't just sort of for the for the high fluting acres, you know, and uh, huge wildflower meadows. It's certainly for us with the tiniest, smallest of spaces. I wanted to jump back to something you you mentioned a moment ago. You talked about the idea of portals, and I think in the book I, I jotted down. You said gardens are portals to the regeneration of our bonds to the wild, and if we take the right path, their remedy will replenish us all. 
and I like that. I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit for us. So I think if you start to look at the uh, original sort of um, um, groundwork that I laid it upon, so the biodiversity declines in the climate sort of situation that we have, um, if you are in a different industry, let's say, so um, aviation or fashion, you are only ever mitigating against the, um, you know, the cause and effect that you are having. So people might offset or, or they try to sort of bring about some sort of net um, sustainability. Gardens are completely different. They literally can be um, proactive regenerators. So, you know, just from even the idea that a tree there is bringing down carbon from the air, but how, so how you look after it and how you enact in your garden is going to make tangible positive differences. Um, here in the UK, they've even started to release reports that there's more tree cover in gardens now in, in towns and cities and, than there are in the countryside. So the agriculture has taken over to such an extent that actually the gardens are the ones that are holding on to bird life and um, as in, in certain wildlife that demands the, um, the habitats that are receding in the countryside. So it's actually far more important and, and than people even realize. And I think that was what I was trying to get to there is that if you go out there and you make these differences, they're going to be real for you. If you put in a pond, if you let the grass go long, wildlife is going to come to you. Um, and so you are there increasing biodiversity as you go. Um, whereas, you know, if you, you get lost in the idea of oh, feeling bad about driving too far or something and you need to go and plant a tree, you're always mitigating against. And so I think that was the, the key of it is to think of a garden as this portal towards what it is, is this natural space. And so, you know, going out into the wild and thinking, wow, this is fantastic. Your garden is a, is a pocket of wild. It, it will never be purely wild because it's, it's an interaction between ourselves and nature. Um, but it, will, it can be, um, uh, you know, much more um, regenerative uh, than anything else. Absolutely. Matt, there was something else you said in the book that uh, that I really enjoyed reading. And you said, if we design our gardens to be regenerative, the result will be functional, beautiful spaces full of life and vigor, robust enough to face the challenges of the future and elegant enough to beguile all those who walk among them. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that that cuts through to my sort of core philosophy is that number one, um, you must be allowed to express yourself in the garden. You must have the liberty to be able to say, this is, this is me and this is what I want to do, just like your clothes, you know? So there must be sort of a form of beauty to what you are doing in your garden and you must believe it and beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so what you believe. Um, and so to start to sort of think ecologically, you must never forget that but it's being able to sort of look at the garden and say, is this functioning ecologically? So, um, you know, most gardens are going to need water to sustain them, um, but most gardens don't use um, the water that falls on that garden, the rain, um, to, to enact that function. They bring water in from a main system. And that is sort of ecologically sort of perverse, really. I mean, the amount of rain that you, you might be in a dry area and uh, only get a very small amount, but usually those areas are extremely good at harvesting rainwater. But it, you usually get enough rain throughout the winter seasons or the shoulder speed seasons to be able to sustain any kind of watering that you'll need to do through the summer if you design your garden that way. So if you design and have uh, you know, harvesters connected to gutters and drains and, and different sort of um, gullies and alleys that are going to um, send off to ponds and, and holding ponds and uh, irrigation, uh, you know, ponds, then that, that is the um, idea behind saying, you know, look, you, you, you definitely got to sort of start to see it as a working function and what it needs to sustain itself. Same really with, with compost. I think a lot more people are aware 
uh, that a garden needs compost and, and enact composting and and look to um, put it into their gardens but sometimes even then it's, it's simply not enough and they start to buy outside and all that ever does is to sort of say that you're trying to keep this garden going um and you know the infrastructure of it is needed outsourced energy that you just don't truly really need because all of it is there for you you just have to design it correctly you just have to think about it you know design isn't necessarily always about this highfalutin high concept uh, you know high class designing it's more about saying does it work and, and that's usually the best design so i think i think that's that's the core of what i was getting at there is that um, design is really your first footsteps into uh, getting ecological thought and ecological patterns and ecological systems into your garden is is thinking how does this work how does this work for me how's it going to look you know, and how does it sort of express how do you express yourself and how does it represent me and but how does it take away all of our external energy sources to keep it going and so taking that time to think about the design is really such an important first step absolutely yeah yeah i mean always taking the time you know i whenever i um i meet with clients or it's consultations or starting a new on a design uh, i'm always wanting to tell them hey how about you know wait a few months because uh, they're usually sort of moving into some new property and they've just taken over the garden they're all excited and i'm always trying to slow them down i'm always trying to say just have a look have a look where are the frost pockets where how high is your water table do a soil sort of test but just try and find out what your space does naturally and um, how it interacts with the wider environment and, and biome and and that will guide you um, they never do they they always want to, want to crack on with it really quickly but um in your own personal garden definitely like you always try and sort of think about the the system system functions you know and the elemental resources at your disposal sun wind heat uh, water and uh, that always guides your design I wanted to mention for our listeners too that we've been talking so far a lot about the the thoughts that go into ecological gardening but your book is also very hands-on too and and some of the hands-on projects are making a meadow you talk about making biochar a worm composter there's a a whiskey barrel rain collector even a, a bathtub reed bed and i know emma wanted to ask about one of the the hands-on things that's in there so maybe i'll turn it over to you Emma. yeah well something really cool i learned about from the book is coppicing so could you talk a little bit about that and and i should add we thought because we're all about food gardening coppicing is something we thought for for food gardeners too could be such a useful thing in the garden instead of getting bamboo from around the world yeah you've hit the nail on the head yeah bamboo is is grown um yeah quite unsustainably actually not many people know that even though it is a sort of you know organic material so at least not using plastic uh it's growing with quite a lot of pesticides and it, it's sort of um you know the growing of it is quite um unsustainable yeah coppicing is um a wonderfully uh, regenerative um source of material um, uh, all of the practical things in the book, and I certainly at the outset wanted it to be a practical book because, um, you know, otherwise I feel like it's similar to a lot of books that like, like to uh, tell you to do things, like tell you we must be ecological gardeners, we must sort of be climate conscious, we must do this, but never really show you how, and I never wanted it to be like that. I absolutely wanted it to be a, a book that, you know, collects dirt and and it you know gets gets rained on in your potting shed or whatever because you're out there using it i i love that idea um and so coppicing um is certainly used quite predominantly over here for um, hazel rods for um you know pea sticks so you know this the top ends of, of hazel growth is cut off and used for pea sticks and then larger growth is used for beams um, to make wigwams or um, you know frames and so it's, it's an old art 
and it uses trees predominantly, so oaks, uh, hazels, as I've said, uh, willows, ash, um, uh, chestnut, and it, it just sort of lets them um, grow for a certain period of time. Uh, seven years is quite um, a, a normal amount out here within a woodland setting. Um, and then it's sort of cut straight to the ground all the way down to the base. And then that uh, material is used and then it's allowed to grow again um, for another cycle, seven, 10, 15 years. And so what it will do is it will send up, it will completely change the shape um, of the tree and it will start to send up uh, lots more stems, so a multi-stem and they will be straight so that you know this was a, the, the first method of um, bringing about um, workable timber because then you know that you can coppice it again and again and again and you never need to replant um, and so that's why it's, it's beautifully uh, regenerative and sustainable it's, it's incredible really that the, the plants are able to do that um, so it's wonderful because it, it can be on a large scale like, like that is on a commercial scale but in the in the garden setting the species especially like hazel um, grow quite quickly and willows grow quite quickly um, and you only really need one or two species in your garden and if you can look to the long term um, you can really start to harvest these materials and, and be able to once again um, close your loop and stop needing to, to buy any materials from an outside source. I love it. One other thing Matt that, um, that really jumped out at me is you talked about using a scythe in the book mm. and it's it's not something that i see in gardening books at all i can't remember whenever i've seen it and i've only ever once used a scythe i was working in the uk at a nursery for the summer and and that was my introduction to it so i i got thinking about that because here anyway we have people going around with power trimmers power lawnmowers making tons of dust and noise and uh, and I saw the scythe in your book, and I thought that would be a fun thing to dig into with Matt. So maybe tell our listeners about the scythe and and it its role in an ecological garden. Yeah, I mean it is the um, it is the antithesis, isn't it, of um, a sort of peaceful and uh, you know wildlife friendly nature garden is this sort of petrol belching um, lawnmowers making a terrible din. There, mm -hmm. there, there are obviously like, um, as with a lot of this stuff, like climate change, I mean, and, and uh, you know, technologies that are going to be helpful. And, and I've used many battery powered um, stuff over the years in, in my working life. So I don't sort of, um, you know, dismiss that, that there are certain sort of stuff that is now battery powered that is much more ecologically friendly, but the side takes away the lawnmower completely and brings back something that is, is just maybe more of a lost art, a craft that is, is a lot more immersive. It, it suits the situation where you want to grow grass a little bit longer, certainly. So if you're growing grass, um, or your lawn, whatever, a lot longer, and you maybe want to have a certain section um, cut down uh, to sit or, or whatever, then it works fabulously well for that, or it works really well for um, wildflower meadows. In fact, I think it's, it is the only tool for wildflower meadows. So um, I have in the past tried to use strimmers um, and even uh, proper, uh, you know, uh, um, motorized sides but none of them get close um, it is just designed for that it was designed for scything meadows and long grass so it, it is a really um, uh, still quite kind of like niche uh, you know um, pastime and I've, I've, I've needed to go and get sort of a little bit of training from certain experts and you really need to know how to look after the blade and and um, you know it's it's a fabulous looking tool though. Like it's definitely <laughs> if you want to add a really good looking tool to your collection, that is it. But it, it takes a lot of um, upkeep and sharpening of the blade, um, and even um, you know keeping sort of the the wood kind of uh, seasoned and nice. But it really is the most uh, immersive of tools, and it sort of just brings you back to think that you know you can be 
cutting your grass, long grass or whatever. And, um, you know, you're making no sound, you know, you're not, you know, the birds are still singing and you're not sort of pumping any sort of petrol or fumes out into the, um, into the atmosphere. So I would love to see sort of a, a renaissance of the scythe. Um, I mean, we all, <laughs> you know, know it from the Grim Reaper, don't we? But it would be nice if it was, um, if it was seen more in, in gardens throughout, throughout America and throughout the UK it would be great. Yeah, in a positive light. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, something else really cool that's in the book is um, using pleachers in hedgerows. And I had never seen that or heard of that before. And I think it'd be really cool to talk yeah, about that. That was new to me. I'm, I'm excited about hedgerows, but the idea of pleachers is completely new to me. And maybe I'll leave you to explain what they are to our listeners. Yeah, it's... The use of pleachers is in a technique for um, uh, growing and sustaining and maintaining hedge rows called laying. Um, so it goes back to um, uh, agriculture, actually. So if you have a hedge row and that's just full of sort of whatever species um, that would be, whether it's sort of, you know, dog rows and um, older and, and, and ash and, and even oaks or whatever and that hedgerow is predominantly used for keeping in livestock if, if that hedgerow just starts to get too old it will start to um, become top heavy and so it start to have gaps at the bottom and livestock will be able to come in and out and so a technique that these um, farmers and landowners developed was laying and so what you do is similar, very similar to coppicing. And uh, you would take these uh, species within a hedgerow, um, predominantly the larger ones, so the, the more sort of like oaks or ashes, or whatever, and you will cut them uh, down at the base, just like a coppice, but you will cut them through, but leave uh, the tiniest amount. Um, it's, it's quite incredible, actually. It's just a, literally a slither a thread connecting the stump to the, the main stem, literally just a slither. It looks like it's just the bark, but it's enough incredibly to um, keep the tree alive and, and the stem alive. That is then folded down. So you take it, imagine it, it's vertical. You cut it down at the base, almost all the way through. And then you just timber that tree over. It falls flat on the ground. Um, you're doing that because a, a hedgerow is full of, you know, hundreds of species and they're all very closely um, planted together. You're just doing that the whole way along. So whole way along, let's say, I don't know, hundred yards of, of hedgerow. You're cutting exactly the same way all the way along and you're laying it, laying it down on its side. And they then use um, poles uh, in between uh, certain specific spaces that are then tied together and so this whole thing just becomes what would be a living fence more like but it is like a living hedgerow that is um thick at the bottom and will protect um the uh, livestock from getting out and so you know it, it basically predates any use of any sort of uh, wire fencing or anything like that um it's great um, benefit is that it looks fabulous like um, it's a really um, aesthetically pleasing way to keep um, a, a hedgerow in your garden so I've noticed people are using it and I've sort of advocated it um, within sort of garden designs to sort of bring people around if they you know were used to sort of mono species planting so like yew trees or whatever uh, big hedgerows of the same plant and I'm there saying let's use lots of different species and a way of keeping it quite ordered is to do uh, laying and pleaching is the is the method of that lay. Wow okay well and just continuing on with hedgerows what about food plants that you incorporate into hedgerows? Do you have any favorites? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, a blackberry would be the most common. Um, black thorn uh, over here is slowberry. Mm. Um, that's a really important um, hedgerow species for its from its name as you can say thorny so like originally the thorns were put in for that same reason i described for, for livestock um, and and, 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 slow, and i think of slow gin too that must be slow an gin. important reason 
Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> you know, you got to, that's exactly it. That's why they, they sometimes call these hedgerows alcoholic hedges, you know, because a lot of the stuff that goes in there are uh, used to make sort of alcoholic drinks. Um, so, yeah, because like hops, uh, you can have a hop um, a plant uh, rambling through a hedgerow. Um, but yeah, blackberries and raspberries, and, and even like, um, as I was saying, hazels. You can uh, start to harvest hazelnuts if the, you can beat the squirrels to it. So definitely, hedgerows can certainly be um, food resources. You could go, you could go much further. You know, you could really gooseberries and black currants and red currants and and really go for it um, because they all kind of tough enough to suit sort of a a, a hard prune. Um, so you know, definitely a hedgerow with. An edible hedgerow is, is stuff I've done before. I mean, certainly is a great way. It's, it's vertical um, thinking, really. It's, it's sort of this idea that, you know, you could um, grow vertically. So it doesn't even matter if it's a hedgerow. You can grow a lot of these things against a wall or a trellis um, uh, to, to give yourself more space. So for people who are really interested in ecological gardening, um, what are some of your top tips just to get them excited about it and actually doing it themselves in their gardens at home? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, um, I touched on it before, um, is uh, I've noticed now that it's become such an issue, especially over here, our, our, our rivers are in such a poor and uh, degraded state that I really want to sort of, um, you know, champion the idea of, of harvesting your own water and, and, and making sure that you can go, look, I can do this. I know I can do it. I can work it out. And I can get through one year, you know, you know, challenge yourself, say, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna try now this year. <laughs> you know, you probably end up having a drought year, but you know, you challenge yourself and work out and say, how much do I need? How much space do I need to do that to harvest that amount of water that I will need through the summer months? And so that would certainly be a, a good top tip. And um, I also, you know, love um the idea of no dig because I think there's so much um going on underneath the soil and I should clarify a little with no dig. It doesn't necessarily mean you can't dig a hole, uh, you know, put a plant in. It's just this idea that we really become guardians and, and protectors of the soil now, and um, you know, mulching and layering and, and, and sort of trying to sort of um, leave the, you know, uh, ecosystem that is within that soil because soil will take a very 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 long time to grow um, but mulches and organic matter that we put on dissipates quite quickly but the soil underneath takes a very long time and and that that world in there there's microorganisms and bacteria and fungi uh frontier science we're still only just learning how important they are and, and they are us top soils are degrading disappearing so quickly so i think if they were the two tenements um, soil and water and thinking about how you can go about um, you know ecologically uh, gardening within you know those two frameworks would be my, definitely my two main tips. So use less water, dig less, that's really good advice and I'm, I'm just thinking as we start to wrap up that you know uh, a couple decades ago a book like yours some people might have thought of it as being a little bit radical but there's really nothing radical about using less water and digging less so how do you feel about how mindsets have changed in gardening in the last little while yeah i mean i totally agree with you um you know i think that was sort of almost um right back at the beginning i said that i thought that there was a sea change in consciousness you know um um, it's certainly a step up uh, where I feel like people sort of begin to start to see these things as just, um, oh, of course we should do that, but they, they don't really have the the tools in place to do it because you're trying to unlearn like decades, you know, of, of gardening culture and gardening tradition. So I think most people know deep down, like, oh, I, I do want to do my bit, and most people are, uh, are certainly that way inclined to say that. On a, on a wider scale to say, crikey, yeah, we could need to look after the natural world from which we are reliant and born from um, is, a, is a human sort of, uh, you know, condition. You don't even need to sort of um, teach people that, but 
you might just need to give them the tools to do it. So, yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I, I definitely think that um, that's a much better position to be in, to be um, a radical might have been exciting for me uh, in, back in the 1970s. But really, what you really want is to, is to just see um, a, a common thought and a common cause and everyone coming together as a community and um, the, the actions that you do as a uh, as a group and a bond is, is far greater than anything you could do as an individual. Yeah, and I think we're heading in that direction too with the more group mindset that we need to move towards organic and ecological gardening. So I think that's really good, a good step forward. Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, yeah, you, you guys must meet a lot of people and talk to a lot of like-minded people and, and and feel it almost sometimes a little bit more than me. I'm sometimes the lonesome writer just <laughs> sitting here at my desk a lot of the time. But yeah, yeah I, I certainly sort of would hope and, you know, and definitely want to just push towards, you know, um, the idea that it's about what you're leaving behind, you know, like... Uh, um, you know, I mean, your generation, or if not even my daughter's generation, you know, they're, they're the, what you're passing on, and you need to be a custodians for them more than sort of trying to just extract and take and pillage for now, you know, and, and that is what is, is what guides me, and I think what guides many people now. Yeah, and so for the people who want to jump on board and be part of this group of new awesome ecological gardeners and learn how to take care of this planet better, where can they get a copy of your book and when is it out and where else can people find you? Yeah, well, it's out now, um, so they can find it anywhere online, um, your major ones, Amazon, or, uh, or you can find your sort of more bespoke um local ones or local bookstores um and then you can find me um on instagram or, or twitter you know dabbling away in the dark arts of social media um <laughs> so yeah um or you know i think you know I'm, I'm out there and and you can definitely find the book and find me and um and if you're like-minded i'm sure you'll sort of gain from that definitely okay matt Thanks so much for making time to join us and, and talking about being ecological gardeners. Some wonderful tips. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you, Matt. That was our chat with Matt Reese Warren, author of The Ecological Gardener, How to Create Beauty and Biodiversity from the Soil Up. And you can find Matt online at mattreesewarren.com, M-A-T-T-R-E-E-S, warren.com. What did you think? Matt said, your garden is a pocket of wild. It will never be purely wild because it's an interaction between ourselves and nature, but it can be much more regenerative. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm not worried about having a perfect lawn and my garden is far from weed free. But as I think about it, I am a control freak. I want control in my garden. Well, Matt advises... It's about giving a balance, and I know I need to keep thinking about what that balance is for me. I was also interested to learn about the technique of laying and using pleachers, folding down stems of young trees to make a living fence. As we wrap up today's episode, I'm thinking about my former neighbor Troy's mulberry tree. Mulberries grow fast, and he cut it back hard every year. I was the benefactor, getting lots of long, slender branches that were perfect for my peas and beans. So if the concept of coppicing intrigued you, but you weren't sure how to weave it into your garden, perhaps a mulberry tree is one approach. If this episode piqued your interest in hedgerows, tune in to our March 2021 episode called Forest Gardens and Fruit, where we chat with Mark Lord in Germany about fruit trees and bushes, and many of these are great candidates for hedgerows. The Food Garden Life Show is a labor of love for Emma and me. Our goal is to inspire and inform with stories and ideas about gardening, food, and people. We give gardeners permission and confidence to challenge the rules. We can all make a difference in the world. What we eat and what we grow is one way that we can make a difference. If you're a fan, 
please click follow or subscribe wherever you get your podcast because it really makes a difference in how we are ranked. The podcast is back next Thursday, but before next Thursday, don't forget, it's the first Wednesday of the month, and that means that next week's show starts off on Wednesday, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, as our live radio show on Reality Radio 101, and that means that you can send in your questions. Our guest will be Jesse Frost, who is host of Farmer Jesse's No-Till Market Garden podcast. He's also the author of the new book, The Living Soil Handbook, and he will join us to help us keep our garden soil in tip-top shape. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show. I'm Stephen Biggs. And I'm Emma Biggs. Thanks for tuning in.